Hey, good morning, church. What an honor it is to be a part of this church. What an honor it is to serve as your pastor. Uh, there are so many exciting things that are happening in the life of this body uh, that I just sit back and think, wow, God, like, thank you for letting me come here to be a part of this. It's just truly, truly an honor to see what all is happening, to see your faithfulness, to see your care, your love. Uh, we just met with our staff this past week on Thursday and Friday, we did a staff retreat, and it was just such an incredible spirit amongst the staff. And the vision casting that we had to, to know what's coming, I, I want to tell you everything, but I can't in this moment, but just know we have some exciting things coming in the life of our church, and we're already doing exciting things. So I pray for you guys that if you've never been to Arizona, please consider that. I was talking to somebody the other day, I think it was Jeremy, he said, it should be mandatory for everyone in the church to go on this trip at least once. I'm like, I think we should make that a rule. If you're going to be a member, you have to go at least once. But it isn't, there's so much that you can do there. It doesn't matter if you can't teach, but you can serve. You can serve in so many different ways. And so if you haven't been before, I would encourage you, make that an option this year. We've already had people meeting in the office about what it would look like if they went to this trip next year. So if you're scared, if you're nervous, or if you just want more information, we're continuing those conversations right now because we need you. If you can see on there, over 100 students, we need all the help we can get. And it's truly an incredible week. So thank you for sharing, Blake, and the team that went. Incredible job. All right. I could talk about that forever, but I do got to preach. So let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3 is the passage we're going to be out this morning, and we're going to continue our series on the 12 characteristics of a healthy church. This is number 10. So that means we have today, obviously, and then we have ordinances, baptism, and Lord's Supper the next week, and then the final week will be prayer. And that's kind of the way that we're going through this. And, uh, and then there will be one break sermon where um, I'm going to really kind of preach on some vision that we come up with even over this past week and just to share with you where we're going. And then the next week, my friend from Dubai, from the pastor of EBCI Baptist Church in Dubai, will be here in the flesh preaching at First Baptist Church. That's incredible. I'm excited. That'll be August 18th, so you can mark your calendars uh, for that. And so he's traveling into America and just wanted to come and just thank the church personally uh, for the gifts that we gave him last year and just to share his heart with you guys. And I thought it was an incredible opportunity. So that's where we're going over the next several weeks. But today we're going to be covering the characteristic of biblical leadership. Biblical leadership. And the essential question that I want to ask this morning is what should we expect from leaders in the church. What should we expect from leaders in the church? And I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm putting myself in a physical, literal spotlight, obviously, but also just hypothetically, I'm putting myself in this spotlight for you this morning to evaluate who I am as a pastor, to evaluate who our other pastors are, what we do. We're basically putting ourselves out there this morning to say, what should you expect from us as your leaders. It's been a pretty challenging week as I surveyed Scripture on this topic. But let's read here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 1. It says, The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if anyone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert or may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Pray with me, church, over God's word. Lord, we are so thankful for your word. It equips us, it trains us, but also humbles us. God, it gives us a picture of what you expect from us. And God, I know it's challenging, but I pray, God, that you would uh, convict us this morning. Show us, guide us, and teach us through your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
like to take you back to the year 1776. If you're a history buff or know anything about our country, that's a very important year. In the winter of 1776, whether you realize it or not, the war for American independence had lost its optimism and the glamour. And they were on the verge of dissolving after the feats they suffered and their army continually shrunk and they saw no real path forward. However, there was a 10-day stretch of time that a particular leader led a charge through risk and bravery and prevented the collapse of the war effort and provided renewed momentum. And many people think back to this 10-day stretch is literally the reason why the Americans won the war and we stand here today as Americans. And the leader at the helm of the army during this time was none other than George Washington. George Washington, during this 10-day plan in December of 1776, had a plan to attack the British army, but it was described as extremely complex and fraught with dangers that could easily lead to defeat. He came up with a code word that day. The code word that he came up with to describe this effort was victory or death. I think this demonstrated his awareness that this was an all or nothing campaign. We will either win in this 10 day stretch or we will be killed. That was his leadership capabilities in this moment. So on December 25th, 1776, Washington led his forces into New Jersey across the Delaware River, which is the picture we have here. This depicts his journey across the Delaware River. There were supposed to be three companies of soldiers to cross the Delaware to attack the British. But only one division of soldiers made it across, and it was the division led by George Washington. Now on the other end of the Delaware, behind enemy territory, with only a third of his troops, Washington could have retreated and turned back, but he said, no, today is a day, victory or death. And he marched on to this campaign and against all odds, defeated the British in this battle. And many people look back to this battle as the turning point in the war. If it wasn't for the bravery, the courage of George Washington, the risk that was involved, we may not be sitting here today as Americans. That's incredible for me to think about as I read through history this week. When you think of the most powerful and influential leaders throughout history, I think what comes to our mind is men like George Washington. And rightfully so. They're courageous, they're bold, they're confident, they're powerful, they're daring. They have all these amazing characteristics. So in our minds, when we talk about leadership within the church, I think what happens sometimes is we begin to use those characteristics that we see in these great world leaders, and then we begin to apply that to just all leaders. And I'm not saying these are not good qualities. As I look back on George Washington's life, I admire his characteristics. I wish so much that I was like that, right? I even took a picture this week and, and our staff retreat is pretty funny, but I even like to make this pose, right? It just makes you feel powerful, you know? <laughs> you should do it sometime. It's really, it's really, it does something inside. As you see George Washington's pose, like, it just speaks power. They're courageous, they're bold. So these characteristics are great, but is and are those the characteristics that God would have for leaders within the church. As I begin to survey scripture over the past couple weeks, I begin to see that maybe this is not exactly the picture of leadership that God has explained in his word. But there's a different picture. So as we are considering what leaders should be within the local church, might we consider a different perspective? Might we consider what scripture is telling us this morning to what God expects from these leaders. What are these characteristics that the leaders should possess? Who should they be? What should they do? Who are they? It may not be George Washington's characteristics, but I still think they're essential for our church to be healthy. So the way I'm breaking this sermon up this morning is into three parts. We're going to keep it really simple this morning. We're going to consider biblical leaders and we're going to ask, who are they? What do they look like? And what do they do? All right, we can get it this morning. Who are they? What do they look like? And what do they do? So first of all, we're going to start on who 
are they? This may be redundant for you guys, and it may not make a lot of sense, but I think it's kind of essential that we start here, that we ask the question, who are we talking about when we say church leaders? Through Scripture, you have several terms that you can choose from. Pastor, deacon, elder, bishop, overseer, evangelist, prophet, apostle, priest. When it comes to the New Testament church and, and the church that we have here in Mayfield, Kentucky in 2024, which title are we talking about? Who do we define as church leaders? And who does the text in the New Testament define as church leaders? Well, if you remember from our text in 1 Timothy chapter 3, what does it say? If anyone aspires to the office of an overseer. All right, think about this for a minute. I don't know about you, but I've never heard anyone call a pastor an overseer. No one's ever walked up to me and said, hey, Paul, do you want to be the overseer at First Baptist Church, Mayfield? I don't know. What does that mean, <laughs> right? Overseer. This is a very unique term, a very unique word. But this is the term that is used, the Greek word. We might think, well, maybe this is the word that we get the word pastor from. So it's overseer or pastor. Well, if you look at the word here, it's episcopus, which is not the word which we get pastor from. So who is this that the Scripture is talking about? Overseer, episcopus. In Acts 20, it says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. This same word again, episcopus, overseers. Here's the problem, though. We turn to 1 Peter chapter 5, and it begins to talk about church leaders. Peter writes, so I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory of God that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Now we have the word elder. You go back to the Greek, guess what word this is? Not episcopus. It's presbyterius. So now we have two unique words to describe what looks like the function of a pastor, but now we're calling them overseer and elder. Still no pastor. And it can be unique, and that's why I'm kind of bringing this up, because I want us to understand that there's some language difference here. There's some things going on with the text that we might need to make sure that we understand because it could possibly be a little confusing. But if you look at these three passages side by side, the First Timothy, the Acts 20, 28, and the First Peter 5, I think the picture begins to be a little more clear. If you look at these passages side by side, there's three words that stand out in the Greek. It's overseer, it's elder, but the verb that they use to describe the function of these two positions is to shepherd, which is where we get the word in the English pastor. So in the text, overseers and elders do one thing, they pastor. So as you can imagine throughout history, as we've developed this word to describe this function, now we see where we get the word pastor from. So I think it's rightly so if we look in the text, and I know this is a long explanation to tell you this, and I could have just simply said this, but I think it's obvious through Scripture that we can apply these three terms to the same position. That whether the text uses elder, overseer, or pastor, they're all describing the same person and the same function and the same office. So office, overseer, elder. So if you think about it, we took those nine terms and we took them down to three. And so I want to describe this. So putting all this together, I think it's safe to conclude that we can interchangeably use these words Together, So now we have pastor, elder, overseer. I believe I'm putting us forward to you as pastor, myself, and our pastoral staff that we have here. Blake, Mason, Paul, you've elected us as this, this office as pastor, overseers. Not just me, just your senior pastor, but they have the title of pastor. I think it's talking about us during this time. So now that you know the what, who are we talking about? Now I want to ask this second question here. What do they look like? What do they look like? What are the adjectives that Paul uses to describe ones in the office of pastor? In our text in 1 Timothy 3, Paul is writing to Timothy while he's in Ephesus. He's providing oversight to the churches of this region. Paul knows that how vital the pastors are to distinguish themselves from the false teachers. The false teachers in Ephesus were running rampant. So he provides a list of adjectives to describe this is what the pastors should look like. This is the description of them, and it should be distinct from 
the false teachers. And he starts out the text by this, saying in verse 2, he says, Therefore an overseer must be. Hear this this morning, church. These are not just a list of suggestions. If you see the crux of what he's saying here, he says, an overseer, pastor, must be. So essentially what I'm saying to you this morning, that your pastoral staff, we must be these things that he lists here. And you are to hold us accountable to these things. And it's challenging as we think about that. And as I put myself under the radar, under the spotlight to say, hold me to these things. And I put our pastoral staff under these adjectives to say, this is what you must expect from us if we are to be a healthy body of believers here at First Baptist. Let's read some of these together. The list is long and very difficult, I think, in my mind. Even the first one here, what does it say? An overseer must be above reproach. We don't use this word very much probably, above reproach. What does that mean? It means irreproachable. Thank you, Paul, for the obvious. This literally means when charges can be brought up, because anyone can make an accusation against me or our other pastoral staff, but when charges are brought up against us, there should be no proof of any wrongdoing. You should not have any evidence to convict us of any wrongdoing. The word literally means blameless. I don't know about you guys, but even in the first characteristic, I'm already starting to sweat a little bit. Blameless. In my personal life, in my family life, in my work life, in in every aspect of my life, there should not be one way that you can convict me and our other pastors of any wrongdoing. Blameless. Can you imagine, church? But that's what it says we must be as your pastors. He goes on, he lists, and we can stop there and think, wow, we've got some prayer to do, but let's keep going. He's got a lot more. He says, the husband of one wife, several meanings for this, but it's having the character of a one-woman type man, faithfulness, completely devoted physically and emotionally to our one wife alone. I will be honest with you, this is one of the ones out of the characteristics that I don't think I struggle with too much. I love my wife. I only have one. And I love her dearly, church. I want you guys to know this. I'm committed to my wife. I promise you that if there's one thing that I do in life that I feel like I strive for, and that's to love her so well. I know I'm not perfect, but I am committed to this woman. And I want you to know that, church. Husband of one wife, sober-minded, vigilant, focused. Sometimes I struggle with that one. I'm going to be honest with you. Focus is not my strong suit. So being vigilant, being focused, being of sound mind, self-controlled. Now, I I admit there's times, yes, that that I can bring these qualities out, this soberness, this sound of mind, but it's saying I think you should expect this all the time, right? To be vigilant, to be focused, of sound mind, to be respectable, virtuous, modest. Then we throw another one in here, hospitable, If the list wasn't hard enough, now I got to be welcoming to you all. (laughs) I'm just kidding. This one's pretty easy, right? Welcoming, loving of strangers, inviting. It's like, man, like, okay, God, oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. You see how this is starting to pile up a little bit? But it keeps going. The next three, Gordon Fee in his uh, commentary on 1 Timothy kind of links these three together. But he says, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome. The word here literally is contentious brawler. Now, I know when you see my physical physique here, you think contentious brawler. This man was a fighter, but that's probably not the case. I used to love to box. Funny story, completely off task here, and it just hit me in the moment. I used to love to box growing up in high school and college. It was so fun. For some reason, I was quicker than all my big friends, and I thought it was fun. I could kind of dance around, hit them a few times, and not ever get hit. But one night, I got hit. And it hurt real, real bad. It was a big, strong guy, which is a haymaker. I was seeing stars for like 10 minutes. That was the end of my boxing career. <laughs> so not much of a fighter here. But in all seriousness, it's not necessarily this physical brawler, but it's this attitude of gentleness, not quarrelsome, not stirring up, but being patient, 
and kind and gentle. And the list goes on, if you can't imagine. Not a lover of money. That's usually pretty good for ministers. We don't have to struggle with those things a lot of times. Not a lover with money. I remember when I first married my wife, um, I told her before we got married, I was like, I'm going to be a pastor. And she's like, okay. It's like, I don't think you understand. That means we are going to be broke. <laughs> the church has been so good to us, okay? Please hear me. Don't hear me say this, right? The church has been so, so very good to us, and they have taken care of us tremendously. And so this one, um, for the first time in my life, I can struggle even with this to think that, like, there is money here now. Like, I actually have money as a pastor. It's incredible. But not to even love that, not to even look to that. And it keeps going. Managed household well. Not a recent convert. And well thought of by outsiders to have this good reputation, not only among the church, but even the outsiders. These are not duties Their responsibilities, their qualifications, their moral characteristics, their outward observable behavior. See, the context that we're looking at are these false teachers. Their outward observable characteristics suggested that they were distorting the gospel that they were trying to proclaim. Their conduct mattered. The gospel and what they were teaching was being affected by the way that they were on the outside. And I submit to you, church, that as pastors, as leaders within the church, our conduct, it matters. For a moment, all we have to do is to survey culture to see that it's very easy to see how characteristic flaws and sin in the lives of pastors can lead to so much damage and disgrace for not only the church, but for the gospel of Christ and for families. Today, it's ever increasing that pastors are failing to uphold the characteristics of 1 Timothy chapter 3. We see this in the headlines all the time. And I hated to even mention names, but just to, just to throw some out here, I just realized, not realized, but just recently saw in the last few months where Tony Evans recently had to step back due to sin in his life. If you're familiar with, if you're familiar with Robbie, Robbie Zacharias, his whole ministry ended. Frank Page, the president of the Southern Baptist Convention years back, was caught doing immoral things and had to walk away from this leadership position. Mark Driscoll, I'm sure you've heard. Carl Lentz, professor, one of my dear professors at Southern Seminary that I wanted to go study in the PhD program under this particular professor so that I could learn and grow from him because I thought so much of this man was having a marital affair for years. He was caught, had to resign, and in an instant lost everything. This story can be repeated over and over and over in our culture today. I heard a recent study that said that only three out of 10 pastors finish well. Only 30% of pastors actually finish without morally failing. As I, as I hear those statistics, as I see these great men who has fallen, I just ask you to pray for us, church. Pray for your pastors because I don't want that to be me. I want to finish well. I want to uphold the characteristics in 1 Timothy chapter 3 that you can look to your pastors and trust and know that we are doing exactly what God is calling us to do, not for a few years, but for the entirety of our lives. Church, pray for us. It's a tall order. If you look at all these characteristics together, there's a lot there. But you must expect this from us, and you must hold us accountable to these characteristics. Let's move on to the third one here. Okay, what do they do? You've seen this kind of work out, right? We've seen what they are what they look like, but then what's the verbs that define their life? What do they actually do? I've always heard it said, right, that you only work on Sundays. You ever heard this about preachers? Like, ah, you shouldn't be a hard job. You only work on Sundays. What do they do? 1 Timothy chapter 3, the only duty mentioned, the only duty mentioned that that even began to, to speak of this verb language 
was the ability to teach. That was the only characteristic listed there that really spoke of competency and action that was beyond just the characteristics of their lives, was able to teach. So I think we could begin by saying that one of the primary responsibilities of the pastors of this church is to teach. And I want you to know that I take this position very seriously. Could be an option to give you some Saturday night specials to kind of like, I don't know what I'm going to say on Sunday morning, so let me just figure this out on Saturday night. This is not the case in my mind, and I want to hold our other pastors to this, that every time we show up on this stage or in classrooms to teach, I want you to know that we are dedicated to the teaching ministry of the church and see this as one of our main responsibilities as your pastor, and I want to continue in that. I want you to hold us accountable to that. But if we look in Acts chapter 20 and 1 Peter chapter 5, this is where we find the verbs of what it means to pastor. And the word that they use to describe the function of an elder, an overseer, if you, if you remember it from the first section there, it was to shepherd. That's the verb, shepherd. It's an agriculture term. But that's what it uses to describe what pastors are to do. They are to shepherd. Acts 20, they're to shepherd. First, first Peter chapter 5, they're to shepherd the flock. I think we're at a little bit of a disadvantage today because... I don't know if you've realized it, but you can walk outside and drive around Mayfield and you're not going to see too many shepherds, all right? You can drive around our entire country and you're not going to find too many shepherds. So what we have in our minds about what it means to shepherd has been formed through scriptures that we've read, movies that we've watched, but we've not lived in this culture where shepherds is an essential part of that society. But in context, they did. They lived where shepherds were there every day. They saw shepherds. They experienced shepherds. They were some, some of them were shepherds. So when they described a pastor, they said, you know what a, shep- a pastor does? He's a shepherd. And in that culture, they immediately resonated with what that meant. And so in order to really define and understand what we are supposed to do as pastors, I think it's really important to know what a shepherd does. And I think you realize, right? Yeah, they tend sheep. I know what a shepherd does, okay? But I think it's a little deeper than that because when I was in the Middle East, I got to experience what it was like to see real shepherds. Can I tell you about this experience? It was incredible. Not in Dubai. There wasn't many shepherds in Dubai. But Lindsay's mom came to visit us in August one time. And if you know anything about Dubai in August, it's terrible. It's extremely hot, 130 degrees outside most days can't even experience like this kind of sun. I try to tell people, it's like, you know how hot it is when your eyes, eyeballs literally burn. That's how hot it is. You walk outside and the first thing you feel, your eyeballs just burn. Anyway, so we're like, okay, what are we going to do? You know, Carolyn's coming here. I want to give her a good experience, but we can't do anything. We're just going to sit in here in the house all day. So we heard about this place in Salala. It's a nice name already, right? Salala. It's in Oman. It's the country next to us. They said, there's a place there within the mountains that it's like 80 degrees and rains. They're like, in August? They're like, yeah, in August. So like, we're going there. <laughs> Little did we know that it was a 14-hour drive. <laughs> and when I say through the middle of the desert, I mean through the middle of the desert. We didn't pack any food with us because we thought, are you going to stop at restaurants on the way? <laughs> you know, all this stuff. We were in the middle of the desert eating peanut butter and smashed up dates because we brought no food with us. That was all we had because there was nowhere to stop. It was kind of sketchy if you think about it. I don't know why we did this, but we didn't know. It was a different country. We were in a new country. We didn't know anything about it. We drove 14 hours through the desert. We, we crossed this mountain range, and then all of a sudden we entered this town called Salala. I mean, off the beaten path. I mean, it was like you take a trip into time. But one of the primary things of this society was shepherds. So as we were there for the week and we got to drive around and see this society operate, we just got to admire these shepherds. And for the first time, man, this word shepherd began to resonate with me on a whole new level because I've started seeing what it meant to actually be a shepherd. One of the first things that I saw and that I noticed about these shepherds were just how reliant the sheep were for food. I got a few pictures maybe to help you understand this. I'll show this first picture. This is, this is Salala. This is the town we were at. Barren, dry, dusty, rocky desert. There's nothing there, all right? 
You drive 15 minutes down the road into another mountain range, and this is what you come to. Isn't that incredible? It changes so much, and it oftentimes depends on the type of season and the rain in different locations to produce these kind of oases. So the shepherds, they have to know where these places are. If a sheep was just wandering away, they're going to end up in so many of these desert places with the camels, and the sheep can't eat what the camels eat. I don't know what those dudes eat, but they somehow survive. But sheep can't survive in that kind of environment. So the, the shepherd would have to guide them to the food all throughout the year. So they were reliant on the shepherd for even their sustenance. And as I began to think about, what does this mean as pastors? What are we, if we're to shepherd, and you think about what Jesus even told Peter, he says, feed my Sheep, not literally supposed to feed you physical food, but the Word of God in Scripture is our food. I'm supposed to give you the food of the Word. That's one of my primary responsibilities, to teach you. Our source of food is the Word and the will of God. And I think it's my responsibility to, to give you this, to guide you, to know the ins and outs and the lay of the land, and to understand how to find the food. And right, it often says, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. I understand that. I can't, I can't force feed you, but I think it is my job to, to, to get you to this food, to show you so that you can begin to eat for yourself. But a shepherd has a big part in feeding his sheep. One of the second things that I noticed about shepherds were immediately when you saw the shepherds, they were filthy. You get this picture in the movies, and they're like, you know, in their nice robes with their staffs walking around. I mean, they look like homeless people, dirty from head to toe. You know why? Because they had to sleep with their sheep. There was no pens. There were no fences. They couldn't leave and go home and then come back the next morning. No, when they were on duty, they had to sleep with their sheep. They were with them all hours of the day. Their care for their sheep was something that I've never seen before. They were completely devoted to their flock because they were responsible to them and for them. As we begin to see this passage, then I see Hebrews chapter 13, and it begins to kind of paint a bit different picture. Verse 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. These shepherds were a lot of times poor, and they were, they were almost like slave workers for the very wealthy people in this country. And if something happened to their sheep, they would have to give an account to the owner. So they wouldn't leave the sheep. They stayed with them. They cared for them. It was their responsibility. Now as you see what pastors are to the church, as you see how this is working out, God is telling us he's appointed shepherds over churches, pastors, to care for them. And that one day we are going to have to give an account for your soul. Church, when I read this, as I was even thinking about what it meant to come back here and pastor, I read these words and I began to cry. Think about this. I'm going to have to stand before God one day and give an account for your soul. Think about the pressure that's involved in that, the responsibility that I have to bear. But that's the role that God has called me to, and that's the role that he expects from us and that we must be. So I need to care for your soul to be responsible for you. And the last one I'll say here, that the shepherds protect. And I got to thinking like, like, what does this even mean to protect? And for some reason, this story came to my mind. I don't know why. But I was in Malaysia and uh, touring just some different things uh, with, the, with the missionary there. And we were teaching in the seminaries. But anyways, he wanted to take me to a Hindu temple. And uh, so we visited this Hindu temple. And at the Hindu temple, there were a lot of monkeys there. I don't know if you know anything about monkeys, but these dudes are bad dudes, all right? You see, like, Curious George and, like, oh, cute monkeys. No, monkeys are vicious. They got, like, fangs as teeth, and they're wild, and they hiss and bite and scratch and carry diseases, and they're not cool, all right? And at least in Malaysia, they're not. So we're walking up to this Hindu temple, and the missionary's here, and we're walking up the steps, and all of a sudden, coming from this direction is this monkey, and he's like... Like, like out of the movies or something. He's on his hind legs and he's doing like this and he's hissing and growling and he's coming right towards us. And I just so happened to be standing in between my missionary friend and the monkey. And my missionary friend kind of pushed me this way and did this and hid behind me. And there I was with this monkey coming towards me. 
Like, I had no choice in the matter. Like, I was appointed in that moment to stand in between the danger and the missionary. As I think about what it means to pastor, so many times we didn't choose this position. It's not like we wanted this responsibility to say, yes, I want to be responsible for your souls and to stand in the way between danger. But God has appointed us for that task. We find ourselves in this position as pastors that we are supposed to stand in between to warn, to protect, to care, to be responsible. As we're talking about leadership, I think it's often, you know, we can get the wrong picture of leadership. What, what, is, what does it mean to be a leader? If, you, if you're thinking leadership, well, this means a, a leader and one who is not a leader, right? So even First Peter talks about this, and he's, he's afraid of this. As, a pers- as First Peter is telling, uh, as Peter is telling how to be a leader, he says, don't lord it over them. He's reminding, yes, just because you're a leader, it's not that like you have this like this de- demanding leadership style that you're, you're, you're getting to lead and have honor over everyone. No, he's like, it's a responsibility that you're basically standing in the gap and you shouldn't think about your position as lording it over someone. Because I thought about my leadership, how would I want to describe who I want to be as a leader? And I don't want you to get the wrong impression of how I see my position and our other positions, our staff, between us and you. Some may call it servant leadership. We've heard this. You're very familiar probably with this term, servant leadership. And I think it's easy for us to say, yes, I want it to be one of servant leadership, but I think that's only about half the picture. And for that reason, servant leadership is not the greatest terminology to use as how you would describe our relationship. Now, I will say at this point, my wife has published an article on followership where she did a lot of research on servant leadership and this idea of followership. And it's an incredible article, and I I don't say that to kind of like brag or anything, but it's really she's done a lot of good work. And so if you want to know more details about this term followership, you can read her article. What's it called? Uh, Fueled for His Glory. Something like that. You'll look it up. Lindsay Wilkerson, Google it, and you'll find it. All right. But she introduces this idea of followership, which is really comes from Timothy Paul Jones in his book called Slaves of the Most High. He comes up with this term, followership. It's not servant leadership. He wants to call it followership. And this is what it describes it as. Oh, let's see here on the next page here. Timothy Paul Jones, he says this, everyone, even the leader is a follower first. And everyone, even the leader, is continuously being led by God. It's this idea that leaders are first called to submit themselves to God. Then once submitted and oriented toward following God, the follower leader can guide accordingly. Church, I want my identity to be found in following Christ, not in my ability to have power and influence over people. We can use servant leadership basically to get our subjects to do what we want them to do. And that's what secular culture is doing to servant leadership. Like secular sources are using servant leadership to say, if you serve your people, you can accomplish your organizational goals. I'm not saying I don't want to serve you, but I don't want my ministry to be defined only on serving you so that we can achieve our organizational goals here at First Baptist. No. I want my leadership to be defined as I'm a follower of Christ. I'm submitting myself to Christ. As your leader, I'm submitting to him so that I can rightfully say, follow me as I follow Christ. I always heard that term from Paul and I thought, wow, how bold that is for Paul to claim that. Follow me as I follow Christ. Really, Paul? You're going to say that? And now I'm sitting here saying that. Think about the pressure, the responsibility. Follow me as I follow Christ. Hebrews 13, 7, it says this as well. It says that we should be your examples of how to follow Christ. Your pastors are your examples of how to follow Christ well. That's what you should expect from your pastors. In order for our church to be healthy, we must be these things for you. And the last point that I want to talk about here, I want to bring this to a conclusion. And I know I've spent a lot of time talking about me and the other pastors here. I think it's important because I want you to know what to expect, because I want you to be able to hold us accountable. But as we conclude and we go to, okay, now where do you fall into all this category? 1 Timothy 3, verse 8, he introduces another 
office in the church. He calls it a deacon. He says, likewise, likewise, the deacons must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine. Did you know this list is very similar when it comes to deacons? There's only one thing that's different. And the deacons don't have to have the characteristic of being able to teach. Very interesting. The character, the character, the characteristics of the deacons are the same. The function, the being able to teach, the competency to teach is not there, but the characteristics, the essential character of this person is the same. So, likewise, we should expect our deacons to be the same. Well, then if you think that, likewise, the deacons are the same. Well, should we not expect the same conduct from our teachers within our church? Sunday school teachers, our children's teachers, our youth teachers, should we not expect them to be a model for the people that they are teaching? Where does it stop? Should we not expect the same conduct and characteristics from our members? Really, if you think about it, if you look at this list, you can pull that list back up if you want to. What characteristics would we not expect from a general church member? So if that is being said now, as you look at these characteristics, I want you to expect that from us as your pastors, but here's the thing as well. I want to expect this from you. Church, our conduct, it matters. We have a witness, not only to the body of believers here to serve one another to love and good works, but we have a witness to the community outside of these walls. And the only way that they're going to see the gospel that we believe is through the conduct of our lives. So I want to expect this from you, partly because I don't want to be the only one held to these standards. But consider this church, in all honesty, like this should be the characteristics that we strive for, the outward observable behavior that points to who Christ is so we can tell others, follow me as I follow Christ, as you look at this list and consider it, which ones do you struggle with? As I was considering this list, I think there were some that I was like, yeah, man, I got that one. Okay, I'm okay on that one. This one, oof. I need some focus. I need some work in this area. You too, as a church member, look at this list. As a teacher, as a deacon, this is what we must be as Christians. Pray with me as we conclude our service. God, we're thankful. On a day like today, it's hard sometimes, God, just to see what you require from us. As we consider our lives, we we see there's so many ways that we fall short. And I know I'm just reminded of even the songs that we sang this morning, God, and how we're We're saying, thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. God, thank you for the grace that's over our lives that as we stand as wicked sinners, you have saved and redeemed us. But at the same time, God, I pray you would convict us not to simply just look to that and to not think that our conduct matters. God, convict us to know that it does. (laughs) That yes, there's grace. You provided grace on our behalf, but you also expect our conduct to be a witness to your character. So challenge us as a church, challenge us as a people who represent you to live out what you've commanded in our daily lives, with our families, in our workplace, so that ultimately you will be glorified and that others will be drawn to who you are. God, we thank you for this. In Jesus' name. Amen.